So what was it that helped me get out of the um, fears I woke with in the night? I don't think it was one o'clock. I think it was actually just, I started the breathing exercise at 18 minutes past midnight and ran to 20 past one o'clock in the morning. I gave it just a shade over an hour, you see. It's just um, a practice of breathing into a certain count, usually seven to begin with. Well, I tense the body first and relax. Breathe in, tense the body, relax. Breathe in, tense the body, relax. So there's three of those repetitions. And then I follow it by breathing uh, uh, where I breathe in, hold and breathe out to the same length of time, usually a count of seven to begin with. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I, I gradually extend that over the course of the time, in this case it was an hour, to a count of, um, what did I go up to? Twelve. And, you know, twelve can be comfortable if you come up to it gently. Well, I mean, it depends how much practice you've had with I've had quite a bit of practice, I suppose. Um, um, so I know that that will, in some sense, cause the body and the mind to adjust and start to find a way out of the fears I'm in at such a time. I'm not often in such a state, but um, in times of great difficulty, which I mean I'm going through at the minute, my wife is, um, ex-wife, sorry, is um, considering very practically and acting to move out of the area, which means I will lose contact with my little girl of nine if I so agree to it. If I don't, I'd have to fight some sort of court court thing because she'd resist I expect and I, I don't want it to be horrible but on the other hand I don't want to lose my girl for reasons for her and for me um, yeah but anyway the issue itself is not relevant here to you I don't think what is relevant is a situation of fear and concern and worry which I woke to find quite pressing upon me, a state of mind. Um, it has, you see, at such times, very little reality of the presence of God in one's awareness. One's fixed on the fear. One's taken by, in, I put it in Pentecostal terms, a spirit of fear. Um, my friend uh, Jeff would cast that out. I am... Um, I'm not quite of that approach. I'm not of that approach. But his works, I must say. Anyway, that aside. There's an inclination because nobody likes a situation of fear and concern and stress to have such avoided. We usually do it by saying, oh, what can I do? Find a solution to the problem. In other words, I'm going to affect the external world. But that is not the most effective way by any means, partly because your choice of the solution in such a situation is likely to be hazardous, because you're acting from a position of fear. And it's a bit like acting from a situation of anger. You can do things that are not very well thought out and visualized and understood at all and just get into more and more of the morass of difficulty and stress. So I simply superimposed upon my situation a practice that I know does something for the mind and for the body that avoids, cancels, negates 
the effect of the stress. Okay. And it's my I'm breathing thing, you know. I'm breathe into the count of seven, hold to seven, breathe out to the count of seven. Full, full filling of the lungs from the bottom to the top, top to the bottom emptied, and so forth. Then I thought to count my blessings because I believe in gratitude as the right foundation on which um, our whole being needs to be. And then while doing that, it occurred to me, oh, I had something, whatever it was at the beginning of this, um, the first one of these, this number of recordings, 1605, we're on, aren't we? So 1605.1. I had a thought, ah, oh, I should put this down. It will be a blessing, it will help others. And myself, it may well develop as I dictate it. So it's a, it's a self-interest, but it's certainly blended with a concern for others as well. Yourself and anyone who might hear these recordings, you see. So that may be, may well be, an essential part of your solution in times of stress and worry and difficulty. that you turn inward to God and at the same time outward to rescuing others in such situation. So you use the difficulty to bless others, which also blesses, of course, yourself. I think there's a lot of that in there. So, you know, it's the same thing as a simple thing I've said in the past, that you're in a social engagement and you're on your own and they're all chatting. You look across the room and you see someone who's on their own and you think, ah, oh, can I rescue that person? I'll see. I'll go and make some comment and draw alongside and they may be so relieved to have someone to relate to rather than stand there waiting for others to have their conversations. And they have the courage to join a group and well, they just feel a spare part. So we're a blessing. And in being a blessing, of course, we've solved our own dilemma, haven't we? We're no longer Standing alone either, we're helping them. And if they can't take it and they shake you off when you go to them, well, you know what that's like, don't you? And you can understand that, you just think, ah, oh, well, perhaps I can't rescue this person, but never mind, I gave it a good shot. Do you see you're already back on your feet, aren't you? You're alive. You're there to bless. You might even look around to check someone else, see if they can be helped. And you find someone who can be helped. And he's just blossoming in your company because he's so relieved you've come to rescue him. Isn't that lovely? And you've turned a stress situation into a blessing for someone else and yourself. Thank you, Heavenly Father. So, your problem in time of stress is probably to help someone else. So your solution in time of stress is actually to use it to help someone else. And you'll find God has solved your problem while you were preoccupied <laughs> in helping the other person.
Jesus. <laughs> it's very simple, really, isn't it? I mean, it sounds trivial, but it's not. It's absolute blessing. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I'd like to add that it's so often been my experience that dilemmas vanish. Things that seemed so difficult, so problematic, just melt away. I don't know quite how else to put it, but just that. That what you thought was such a great difficulty, you come back with a different presence of mind. And it's all solved. The stress is just not there because what was seen as a problem is suddenly not seen as a problem. It may even be seen as a blessing. Uh, the relief is wonderful, but <laughs> at the same time, my goodness, remember it, so that you're encouraged in the next time you're faced with such a situation of stress because of something in the outside world, the universe of the transitory, that seems to press upon you. You see, it's coming to it from God's perspective rather than a lonely, isolated self-perspective. We need to cultivate, you see, a continual awareness of God's presence in all the details of our life. Now, I've encouraged people, of course, you probably know by now, <laughs> to do this by be forever thanking God. Tiny things all day long that happen just right. And then tiny things that are not right that you thank Him for and you find you get through and there's little answers and solutions that just put it right. You start to feel the presence of God. Wow. And that is the subject of the previous, um, I think it's the previous one, presence recording that I did. Do you see these recordings? are in the hope and the purpose of blessing you. That you may simply learn from another's experience, in this case mine, and not sovereignly mine, I mean, I've built on the experience of others too, haven't I? And I may perhaps be more able to do that. But able to teach in some way. Able to help you do it. Whereas you might not do it so easily without my help. <laughs> so we become a blessing to each other. True friend. Well, it's God's blessing through us, isn't it? Because he loves us. He is our God. Our friend. Our dad, our mum, I don't care how you see it. But see it. Your God. Visualize your understanding of a perfect God, of a lovely God, of a true friend, 
someone who really loves and cares for you. That is your God. And that love will help you expand to embrace all others, all life, all being, because you're a child of God. And that's who He is. Like father, like son. Like mother, like daughter. <laughs> Like mother, like son, like father, like daughter, too. This universe of uncertainty provides us a fantastic opportunity to anchor our life eternal in heaven. which by definition is the place to be. Because we dress such words with the meaning of goodness and a lovely place, a lovely environment, lovely relationships. That's what we wish to be in. You know, we all have the same needs. And for those that need something else, well, the the universe of uncertainty provides that opportunity and experience from which they distill an overwhelming desire for something better. <laughs> what even they call heaven and we call heaven. So the universe of uncertainty is a wonderful opportunity. for us to abide in life eternal. Always, of course, by definition. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Hey, just to add a note here. <clears throat> Sometimes you can draw an angel that way. Do this. Just pause in the room and remain alone. See who comes to you. They've come to bless. I mean, my goodness, what a wonderful person. They must be the loveliest person in the room. <laughs> and you can do that um, in all situations, you know, whether it's social or whether it's not. You're just alone at home. But you can take a time, make it a special moment or two, when you just wait for an angel to come and talk to you. Probably be God, your Heavenly Father. And you just feel His presence. He will tell you that you love Him. And that will lift you through the ceiling. Absolutely. When you realize you do love him and he's made that possible for you wow love you heavenly father thank you heavenly father let me give a clarifying note just um, at the end here that um the breathing exercises let me be a bit more specific you can do it in three parts, in, hold, and breathe out. As you breathe in, you feel from the bottom of the lungs first, and you breathe up to the top. You hold, then you breathe out. From the top, you empty out to the bottom. Imagine you're filling and emptying a glass of water. It's the top that varies, and the bottom is the last to, um, first to be emptied and last to be. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Last to be emptied and first to be filled. <laughs> um, and then you increase this gradually, and, and no stress, of course. You want something you can do comfortably, 
So yes, increase the number from 7 to 8 to 9 to 10 and so on, but very comfortably don't. You want it to be something you can do for, say, 10 minutes, perhaps to begin with just a few minutes, you know. Um, but you're going to build up to something like an hour or two or three hours, perhaps, who knows. Um, so you're going to um, go very easily on it so that it's feasible. Doing the feasible is much more important than doing something absolutely perfectly right. Do what's feasible and then improve it. You know, don't perfect anything. Perfection is at the cost of using your resources on other things that also need doing. You know, it's better to have everything up to that level where it makes no difference really much which one you attend to improving now because they're all giving they'll all give roughly the same marginal gain um, as opposed to one thing not being done much at all and needing even a little bit of effort to give tremendous returns you don't want things to stay like that you want to shift resources into such a way from something you're doing perfectly perhaps and you're not going to lose much by doing it slightly imperfectly but you're going to gain a great deal by attending to the other thing that needs doing hope you get the drift of what I mean it's the way an economist thinks you equate the marginal returns to optimise that's the jargon and if you want to know what it means, well, it's fine, just say it. <laughs> okay. So you think to yourself, well, I've got five minutes to spare. What's the best way I can use it? Not, shall I perfect this? Because probably the best way of using the five minutes is to bring something else up to, uh, you know, 80% of good standard. And uh, you gain much more from that than simply perfecting taking the dust off the car, you know. Feeding the cat might be more and more important. <laughs> Certainly from the cat's point of view. <laughs> May save him eating a bird too. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Oh, I should just say that this Breathing exercise has uh, an amazingly good effect, a great blessing, will bring you to a peace of mind that starts to see things in better perspective, purifies the body, levels out your thoughts, mm. seems to have a spiritual effect too, you become calm enough and quiet enough. Perhaps you can hear God rather better. <laughs>